with, with a big thank you to the organizers and especially to Simon for arranging for this to happen. I will not wait too long and I, and I would start my presentation. Uh, so humanities and art education are in a crisis and the new liberal assault in these disciplines can only explain the external pressure on the systems. Of course, the entire rationale for this kind of approach to public funding has to do with performance, both that of the university's various departments, but also as seen here in the news from Ontario, the radical new proposal of the conservative government to the grad earning, like tying the funding to grad earnings, right? Imagine if art schools were funded based on this model, what would happen? The danger for this model is that only a handful of universities, mostly the Ivy League bunch, can afford to have humanities program. Allowing the prestigious economy of educational capital to not only sustain, but grow. But can we not also blame humanities and art for this crisis? So what is to be blamed internally? The death of the myth of education. The idea that one needs an education to prosper. How does the above title relate to art and education? That title. Will we see a day when you no longer need a formal art education in order to be a successful artist? A, a private report I have from the University of California, I use it as a sample here in this talk. Young people do not want to do honors in humanities as much as they used to. The honor enrollments in comparative literature has dropped to 17 from a student body of thousands upon thousands. Post-colonial and feminist and cultural study seminars organized along post-structuralist theories are increasingly empty, only soliciting people whose personal life might have been affected by the issues raised in the seminars. So like white, white men are not going anymore to these seminars. Young people are interested in practical and more urgent topics. That's what administrators are talking about. The fastest growing branch of new knowledge in universities is the studies of AI and robotics, but not just programming, also AI-related humanities, like AI and robotic ethics, for instance. This is a very good quote to kind of like begin my, after this dark intro, to begin my sort of like talk. It's from Sidney J. Harris, who was an American journalist for the Chicago Daily News and later the Chicago Times. He wrote 11 books and this is a very important sort of like motto for, for us at the institution, which I will be talking about later. So if you can keep this in mind, it will be, it will be nice. Now, this is uh, a chart from Timotheus Vermeulen's book called Metamodernism, Historicity, Affect, and Depth After Postmodernism. If you take a minute to look at it, I don't know if people in the back can see. So it like looks, at, looks at these concepts and how they function in different historical epoch of modern, postmodern, and what he calls metamodern, which is sort of like this era we're in coupled with like acceleration of technological development, the Anthropocene, and you can even add the, the political crisis we're in to it, right? The rise of, the rise of nationalisms and Brexit and slash, slash Trump. And where, wh where would we put art education or education in general on this chart? What, was edu what did education used to be? And what did education used to become? And to me, this relates to the last slide because if, if the quote we looked at, right, like this one, is from that time, from the modern era, right? So it's sort of like it wants to turn the mirrors into windows. On the postmodernism, we started to like turn the window back into a mirror, self-reflection, right? So where, where, 
where do we, what do we put in the third, third column, right? And in my opinion, it's basically a very Moebius-like movement from one to the other. So we are constantly need to move from reflective to perspective in a kind of a superimposition. Keeping in mind that what we see is conditioned by who we are, always, but this limit is not ontological, but epistemic, meaning that it corresponds to the further development of conceptual and physical tools that further gets us out of ourselves and open new horizons for us. So, so it, it could be a whole, whole other, other lecture to talk about, about epi epistemologically generative consequences of new technologies, technologies both, both conceptual technologies and physical tools. And, and is this the topic that we, this semester, we, we this season or semester, we will, at the new center, we will, we will get, we have two different instructors who will be dealing with this question of like, what happens, what happens when a new tool arrives and what kind of horizons and, and tool, whether this tool is conceptual or physical, what does it do? Like say when, when humans first invented glue, it wasn't just about creating glue, a whole horizon open in front of like the early humans where they realized they can actually stick two things together. That, that did not exist before we actually, they actually did it physically and they realized, hmm, things can stick together. Maybe we can also stick concepts together. So this kind of stuff. And of course, this is a post, you, you said I post a lot on Facebook. This is like one of the things I just posted yesterday and it got a lot of attention. Uh, I don't know, I'm gonna read it. The real crisis of contemporary art is philosophical, it, Philosophical irrelevancy, not just political inaptitude. Even though the latter is undoubtedly the symptom of the former, as well as the obvious sign of the decline of humanity slash humanism as a force capable of a proper and consequential contestation with nature, right? And I put the word regalian there. This is like where in Austria, everybody should know regal at least, right? He, he believed, 19th century art historian from Vienna school, he believed that Art making by humans is, is a contestation with nature to improve upon nature. That's how he kind of like saw art, right? So basically, the crisis, the, the crisis that we're dealing with is not like this guy who sells like tear gas is sitting on a board of some museum, even though that's a political consequences of a philosophical shortcoming. But our real problem is that we no longer are able to be successful in this contestation with nature, which now also includes uh, the offsprings of nature, which is the second nature and the third nature and all these other forms of systems that we created on top of nature, according to Benjamin Bratton, the stack, right? So those who reduce this crisis to a political struggle are not doing anyone a favor by pretending that fixing our political problem will solve it from its growing philosophical and consequently political irrelevancy. Now this is sort of like the kind of ideas that we're already part and parcel of why me and two of my friends and colleagues started the new center back in 2014, right after I was done not only with my graduate education in curatorial studies at the University of British Columbia, Canada, but with the two, three years of generous grants from Canada Council that allowed me to develop the kind of ideas I was working with. And so basically, rather than getting a, trying to get a job at an institution as a curator, or the, the branch of curating that interests me more, which is like public education, I sort of started to think about creating this online platform for education. And there's this interest these days in informal education, right? Like, uh, I've even heard or read somewhere that like the next document is gonna be a lot about informal education, right? But there's a distinction to be made here because, and because um, like the academy you guys are in, right? It's not really informal education, it's just you don't get a degree, but it's very formal. I went and looked at all the classrooms and the way seminars are done and talked to Simone a lot, right? So there's this other distinction, other category that's sort of like we fall into, the new center fall into, or like even you can, after talking to Simone today, your, your school fall into, it's, a, it's formal education, it's not informal, but it's not like a degree granting, or it doesn't have that type of like institutional like stuff. And basically you just gain experience and maybe you learn something, you expand your network, and you, if the school is reputable, and um, this school is very reputable, you can put it on your CV and people go like, oh, that person went to Global Academy and then they must have studied with cool people and all that, right? So, so 
that, 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 that sort of like need for addressing this philosophical problem is what caused us to start a new center as this school that is neither formal nor informal, somewhere in between. And I get to talk about it more if you guys were tired at the end, but I just wanna like go through this, go through this uh, text I've written about, about it. And it's kind of like it abstracts what we do and abstracts what we hope to even achieve more in the future. And there are people here in the audience who have actually experienced our platform and taught, taught for us three people sitting right in front of me. So they can maybe like talk about it also later. It is needless to say that today's educational platforms can be conceived and built on high-speed internet. Despite the shortcomings, the ever-growing reach of planetary computation can provide the basic infrastructure for the creation of new educational institutions. But beside this technological opportunity, which was not available even 10 years ago, there is also another reason to start new institutions. And that is new educational platforms are often born of a commitment to the principle that presenting new ideas to a larger audience does not have to be delayed by the slow process of verification and approval built into our existing educational and research institutions. With humanities, art, and social science departments around the world caught in a losing fight in the crossfire between dominant post-structuralist ideologies and new liberal pragmatist administrations, it is clear that the foundations and aspirations of new institutions will need to be in line with the kind of new left which, while leaving the 20th century behind, is comfortable with confronting complexities a left that finds solution in embracing speed rather than rejecting it and advocates for growth rather than degrowth. These new institutions ought to fearlessly accept that some components of the base capitalist structure, if combined with emancipatory superstructures, can provide practical ways for the eventual exit from capitalism. There have always been centrist and right of center academic practices of utopianism, especially in design and architecture and technology. But while liberal and right-wing ideologies embrace the capitalist tendency of technology, the traditional left has been stuck in the quagmire of technology primary in the negative mode of critique. Filling this theoretical and practical gap, new educational models must consider new forms of technology positive leftism. Much of the political trajectory of this type of thinking was already expressed by Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams's Manifesto for Accelerationist Politics, which was published in 2013. New educational initiatives need to take practical inspirations from MAP and similar texts and manifestos and chart their road to the future. And really, this is like our beginning at the new center. It was like, it really, it really came out of interaction with Nick and Alex and people around, people around that scene and realizing that it's nice to write manifestos about like how you can take bits and parts of existing stuff and build something and it's another thing to actually try to do it and see if it works. So three of us who started a new center, we really thought, okay, we're gonna try this. So what are we gonna do? We don't have a lot of money. We can't, uh, we can't like build an online uh, infrastructure. So what we're going to do is we're going to see what kind of scraps from these horrible, evil companies around we can grab and see if we can build something with them, right? So partially Google, partially Facebook, partially Twitter and Instagram. That's what we had, right? These social medias. And also kind of like use it to basically uh, promote and do the PR side of the school, but also use it actually to connect people and bring people together. And the, the, the first piece of software that became really important to us was Google Hangouts. And Google Hangouts was introduced in like late 2013, early 2014, and we were just jumped, we jumped on it right away, learned it, and, and actually once we established a nonprofit and a school, Google gave us an education license which allows us to like have a lot more capability within it. And now I talk about Google Hangouts because it's, it's already reached a nostalgic moment. Google is phasing out Google Hangout in 2019. They're gonna like get rid of it completely. So we've already planned. So it's already for us, it's like a tool that like we use five years and now it's like, oh my God, Google Hangout is not there anymore. So we're actually going to do a, a special event which we're gonna like celebrate Google Hangout. 
later on in, in November or December. And we're going to invite a lot of people who used it with us, students and, and professors, to talk about their experience and all the funny things that happen to kind of like leave a trace. Because as you know, when these platforms change something, it's like 1984. They pretend it never existed before, right? Because they can't. You always have to move forward, right? They're never going to say, sorry, Google Hangout is missing. They're going to pretend they never had it. So for those of you who want to know what happens or used it, they basically no longer allow you to have a meeting that can be recorded and put on YouTube. So basically you can have meetings and it ends and it's not recorded, or you can go online and broadcast live, but it, you don't get the people interacting. So what they're doing is they're basically killing it and letting startups do it who charge money. And we've already found a different company, unfortunately, that's now is gonna cost us money for the first time to run our seminars. But for these years, it was all based on Google Hangout. And it was really kind of like lovely, but at the same time, the growing pain of them making it better because in 2014 it was really buggy and it didn't work well. Just about the time that it's starting to feel like uh, fifth nature, they're pulling it away. And now we have to like plan and do something. In addition to their obvious epistemological impact, educational initiatives are implicitly political. The production and dissemination of knowledge is the only guaranteed way to irreversibly change the world for the better. This approach highlights the deep politics of knowledge, or what I have previously termed epistopolitics. These more fundamental political transformations hinge upon a constant ep epistemological revolution through which new tools for knowing are introduced, tested, and more importantly, applied gradually to contemporary politics. However, unlike older paradigms in which the arts, unlike the sciences, function only as the negation and the critique of the existing systems of power from an abstracted outside, the alchemical role of art in the future political transformations of the world, you can also say via philosophy, epistemology, and ontology, rather than only through direct politics and negations, need to be reconsidered and repracticed internally. New research and education platforms thus can be effectively structured as spaces which can bridge the gaps between the realms of creativity, thinking, and action. The task of separating useful from stale knowledges isn't an easy one. However, by bringing together interlocutors from multiple networks of scholars, thinkers, and artists whose research and practice are often ignored or marginalized, sometimes even outright shunned, these new educational projects can redefine what kind of knowledges are truly contemporary. From the outset, the aim of such platforms must be to widen the spectrum of thought from the self-imposed rigidity of an overcommitment to the past and present, and instead focus also on a rigorous approach to the future. While, pres while preserving the useful legacies of past theoretical paradigms, it is of the utmost importance for humanities to move beyond Freud, Marx, the Frankfurt School, and post-structuralism, and the collateral limits the institutionalization of these schools of thought have placed on the production of knowledge. This must be done in order for us to reimagine egalitarian emancipation in the age of post-humanism and artificial intelligence. Most most existing institutions disguise their complicity in the neoliberal project through rejecting the Enlightenment universalism and the embracing of identity politics. But there are ways of embracing social movements and intersectional identities that can help us arrive at new transversal alternatives to vulgarities of both modern universalism and postmodern identity politics. The urgency of this task, due to the entanglement of existing institutions in their self-made trap, provides new educational initiatives a political imperative to reconsider new universalism against the tribalism of identity politics, which thanks to the swarm positive aspects of social media has only gotten worse in the last few years. So really, what I'm trying to say is that, okay, we, we understand why universities are caught in this, in this guacmire, why they can't do anything, why they must constantly discipline students, fire professors, put this person on call or that, they're, this is the mess they created, they're stuck in it. But newer places, or like places that are a little bit open, places that are like informal or like semi-formal, semi-informal, they have the opportunity to try the hand because we're a little bit freer. And we can do this in a way that, that existing institutions can't do. And 
The best way to do this actually is to just don't get involved in these arguments. Just focus on what you want to do and focus on your goal. And don't get distracted by all this social media noise that kind of call this that or call this that. And just try to focus on what, you, what you're really about. And thank God this, this Twitter storms only last a week and then everybody forgets. So you can just move on. Where, where, whereas, whereas, whereas older institutions, their mode of understanding media is the old. So like one Twitter storm and somebody has to get fired, right? Because they think this is like tarnishes their reputation or something. Now, now if, we, if we go forward, maybe there will be a time to talk about examples and all that. There it is. This operation involves taking our dreams and nightmares on the horizon seriously and engaging with them fearlessly. This means making connections and working not only with politically sanctioned knowledge producers, but also with a range of thinkers, not all of whom always agree with each other, and not all are favored by the existing institutions of higher education. This means taking risks and embracing criticism, both constructive and negative. The payoff for these risks is creating a full spectrum of opinion on how the future of our planet as a stack of natural, technological, infrastructural, political, and cultural layers can be collectively reimagined and replanned. I'll just leave this like, a little bit on if you want to like, read it. It's about this um, controversy that we got caught in right in 2017. But with this commitment to our goals, we kind of like went through it and it did not tarnish our reputation. It did not do much. Of course, there was a lot of like noise, but we just went straight through it. Regardless of their connections and commitments to particular localities, new educational platforms need to consider that distance, both physical and theoretical, should not limit pedagogical access of potential participants to influential and significant minds and rigorous scholarship. Distances, both physical and theoretical, are essential for expanding the space of knowledge away from the limiting power of tenured professors and closer to the collective spirit of intelligence in general. So here, when I'm talking about distance, of course, it's about like somebody in China and somebody in Africa, but also means somebody who is committed to, say, Marxism and somebody who's not committed to Marxism, somebody who's committed to a particular wave of feminism and somebody who is committed to a different wave of feminism. These distances can actually expand the space of knowledge. We don't, when, you, when you have a place where everybody thinks along the same line, the space of knowing for people who are coming to you to learn shrinks. So this is, this is, this is, this is the spirit that keeps us, we keep in mind at the new center to try to like respect these distances, both physical and theoretical. Embracing these distances instead of considering them a shortcoming enables the participants to develop a new way of collective and shared thinking, one that is not solely based on physical proximity to each other. These distances allow researchers and students to be far more critical of each other if needed. So yeah, so say in a Google Hangout session, it's much easier to tell your professors you don't agree because the body is not there. The impact that a body of a powerful professor has on you is just lacking. You can just say, shut up and hang up and just leave. You know, it's, so the, the, these distances are, are productive, actually. The structure of such gatherings allows the professor to meet intelligent challenges by students who are not otherwise intimidated by the local consequences of disagreement with the mentor and the teacher. The future educational platforms will not be just places to take classes and write papers, but spaces where real intellectual connections are made across the world. Today's technologies make it possible to create a global network of people beyond formal institutional links aimed at knowing as well as thinking and working with each other within or without the platform. These opportunities, sometimes as a direct result of working within a platform and sometimes as a byproduct of an expanded network beyond it, are not only beneficial to the development of new knowledge but would also grant participants, mentors, and teachers access to better professional opportunities in the outside world. New educational institutions must not be afraid of losing the talented people they discovered and supported to existing, to existing institutions. Let a thousand new scholars and thinkers and artists bloom. 
So yeah, so this is this is a really like a like a like a like an issue for 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 us, and we have really like dealt with it and embrace it. It's like in, in the fields that that I'm interested to curate at the new center. It's like I find someone, I work with them. Next thing you know, they get a ten-year job and they can't teach for us anymore because now they're busy. And what what should we do? Should we sit and cry and say, why did this happen? No, we, we embrace it. We say, okay, fine. There's tons of other people that can come and teach who need that opportunity and they can move on to their like lovely tenure position now. And now we made an, we made an alliance. Now somebody in, in, a, in a bigger bigger university is with us. So if if one of our students is applying for PhD or one of our students is applying for masters, we got somebody there who can maybe like uh, be a little bit favorable to that application or like consider those students as someone who comes from the same trajectory they come from. So this is how we've, we've basically handled it and it has happened a lot that like people that we work with, they kind of got a little bit bigger and like, they literally have no time to, to give us back, but that's totally fine. Lacking physical infrastructure and expensive real estate with which an institution can de demarcate itself from the rest of the world, these new platforms need to build their architecture virtually and on a daily basis through the internet and social media. This does not mean the kind of web and social media management offered by online services, but a full spectrum personal, political, and satirical presence that covers everything from pop culture to philosophy and rigorous political debates. The constant online presence of the platform's administrators, researchers, students, mentors, and the rest will remind the world on a regular basis what distinguishes these new initiatives from the existing institutions. These different forms of digital content not only develop the virtual attitude of these platforms, but also provide them with a brick and mortar that holds the actual produced knowledge together. So this kind of explains why I'm on Facebook so much, right? Like, I'm there because I'm not, I mean, people who follow me on Facebook, I rarely post things from the news center on my wall because that has its own like place and goes. And once in a while when I get excited about something I post, but I'm there because I provide a kind of like presence and like, like all, all my other colleagues who, who also do that, but not maybe to my extent, to just, to just show that the news center is, exists. I don't need to constantly talk about the news center to, for my social media to, to benefit the institution, but it does benefit it because people constantly message me. And we, we, we get new members, we get new community members, we get, we get new professors that way. Like, I just basically, uh, I just met, met a very important writer the other day because I posted something and then he liked it and then he immediately comment, uh, contacted me and he said, I really like what you guys do at the news center, I really wanna teach for you. And I was like, man, I've been, I've been trying to like connect with you, you and your partner, both of you are amazing and I want you to, to together come up with a course and teach for us. So that's just, just happened. Why? Because I posted something completely unrelated. Actually, it was a sexual joke or something. It wasn't even related at all, right? So because I try to like not, not be just focused on one thing, which is like what preoccupies my own mind, which is like Bernie Sanders 2020. <laughs> But I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. But uh, but yeah. So so it's like it's like th this way. The, the 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 social media presence is really like part and parcel. And and I mean I'm not talking about again the regular social media presence. We have that. I've got a paid staff that handles our social media. But my own social media presence is a kind of like part of holding the institutions together. Me and other other people around me who who uh, are part of the like uh, organizing committee of the new center. New educational platforms have to keep up with both the growing desire of different geographical regions to partake in their conversations, as well as their rapid development of new communication technologies. On the technological front, self-organization and the production of knowledge need to be integrated into any central and top-down planning of the platform's future developments. On the geographical front, the dominance of English as the official language of art and culture needs to be challenged through injecting other languages into different discursive fronts. Translation and linguistic recontextualization will open the global south to the global north and the global east to the global west and vice versa. So this was the formal presentation I wanted to give. And now maybe I'll just like maybe informally talk a little bit about uh, how, how we operate as, a, as an institution and how we're planning to sort of like develop uh, along the line of this last bit of text I read for you. 
when we began the new center in 2014, it was really like, it came out of a conference I organized in Vancouver called the Incredible Machines Conference. And that was the first time I used Google Hangouts. And the idea was that the budget of my conference, even though it was large, we could only have like a handful of people, fly a handful of people to Vancouver, but we had three keynote speakers, Sohail Malik, Reza Nagarastani, and Alexander Galloway. But, and then a bunch of other people we, we brought, but we were very limited. So I thought with this, with this Google service, what we can do is like we can, we can have more presenters and also people from around the world can watch it live. And, and when that happened, it was like a really like an event because while the conference was happening, we had more than 900 people watching it live. And then, and then you can see the number of people watching and I was like, wow, this is really popular. We should really try to do something on an ongoing basis with this. So right after that conference, which was in March of 2014, me and the two people who really helped me with that, Tony Yannick and J Jason Adams, we decided that like by the fall, we will have a, an ongoing platform ready, which will offer seminars. And then of course the academic side of it was like, they have to be basically rigorous. So which means we, we adopted the, what they called Oxbridge model, which is like how you do proper uh, graduate level seminars with like, People, people read and they present and then responders will respond and people write on a weekly basis. So that was one, 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 one aspect of it. But then the other aspect of it was to basically uh, concentrate on a group of philosophers and thinkers who were, who were already part of this, this conversation of how to get out of post-structuralism, which a lot of them were publishing with, uh, were either involved with Miguel Abro Gallery as artists or thinkers, or they were publishing with Urbanomic Sequence Publishing and the Collapse Journal. So that was like our initial group of people, which we thought people who bring, people who were affiliated with quote unquote speculative realism, even though most of them had moved on from that to some form of rigorous, more rigorous leftist thought. But then my other idea was that we should always leave a big chunk of who teach for us for young and emerging artists and thinkers, because these people will take a long time before they can present their ideas in, a, in an uh, educational setting. Because even if they get a job, for the first few years, they, all they gotta do is like do those courses that were already there and they were hired for. So by the time they get to teach their own dissertation, it's like a decade has passed. And my idea was like, younger people who are just coming out of PhD or like just a couple of years, they've been sitting on a manuscript without it being published, they should come in and teach also so their new knowledge gets presented to young people immediately. So that's how the curatorial plan, plan went. But the idea of funding was also very important, like how are we gonna fund it? Of course we were hoping and planning to like apply and get funding, which we never did actually. We ended up not, not doing any kind, of, any kind of like, we don't receive any kind of like official funding from governments or anyone. But the idea was to somehow self-fund it. So the seminars were all had prices and all that, but then I knew that it's gonna be very hard to like, do it that way. So the idea became to also de develop a membership organization where people want to support us with as little money as like, I don't know, like $10 a month, $15 a month. They can basically become a member. And even though they can't really like sit on a seminar that is live, but they have access to the, to the archives online. And then the magic of it was that by the first week, we already had raised enough funds to pay everyone. So we've never had volunteers at the new center. Everyone has always gotten paid. And the system of like membership and of course I do a lot of fundraising, which is like I go to people who I know they like what we're doing and, and ask them to help support us, support us with money. It's never more than a few thousand dollar. Never more than that. We don't get like million dollar. If we get it, you'll notice it. Um, <laughs> But, but we, 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 we managed to pay ourselves, pay our instructors, and pay anyone who, did, who lifted the smallest finger for the new center. And that really became const constitutional for us, which was like, we we're never gonna ask anyone to work for free for us because we just have to make sure we expand, make sure there's enough members coming in. And the, the amazing thing about, about watching, a, watching, watching a previously live seminar recorded is that it feels like a classroom. It just feels like a classroom for which you didn't prepare and you just sat there quietly and didn't say anything. But you're gonna get all the, di all the dynamics, 
everything that's happening just plays out in front of you just like a live class. We've all been to those seminars which we didn't do the reading, I didn't say anything, right? So it really preserves something, not just the, the lecture, not just the content, but all the dynamics of a, of a seminar setting, which is very important to production of knowledge, gets preserved in, the, in, this, in, the, in these videos, and all of them are online, and every semester, tens of more videos get added to our archive, and we always have to back it up because we never know, like one day Google may decide to like just delete everything or like something, so, so we have this like paranoia, so we, we back it up and back up the backup and all that, but all of our videos are online, and those who pay membership have access to all these archives, and anyone who takes a seminar automatically becomes a member by, by paying, paying for a seminar, and they have access to all of it. And so far, we've done great without needing to sort of like fill up five, 10 page application and put like a plan. And that actually, the freedom that we have with that is kind of like this type of new type of uh, a fundraising that people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are doing, right? Like just small donation and you, ha you maintain your integrity because you're not indebted to funding agencies who for them would be like Wall Street, but for us would be like, I don't know, Canada Council because I can always like tap into Canada Council and all that. So yeah, so so far we've kind of like resisted the, the urge to kind of like get, get into like that kind of like competition. Another thing, another thing, part of our success is that we don't trash academia. We don't go after universities and say, oh, they're bad. We recognize what they do and what they offer and is legitimate even though we, we see the crisis in these institutions, but we find them supportive and legitimate. And we work in between these other institutions. So we get a lot of support from tenure professors who have good income. They love us because they think what we're doing is essential because we're providing like a, a place for younger scholars to practice their teaching skills or to practice their their, their knowledge that they're producing. We create a way for people who are brilliant, but they're, uh, my mother's calling from Iran. Sorry, I can't answer you. <laughs> uh, but, but we, pro like the brilliant students who basically their brilliance is not reflected in their GPA. They get a chance to like redo their proposal, meet new people, and get another chance to maybe go to, go to university, go to like a good rigorous program. So it, it so far has worked this way. And, We've been approached, especially this year, now that we've done the five-year thing, by art schools, by two different art schools, to become degree granting through their program. And this is something that we really have to think about and plan, and if you want to go there. But part of me really wants to resist that. Because A, we don't want people to get a, a student loan for us. I don't want anybody to, to go under any debt in America for us, because that's what happens. If you become degree granting, then immediately people can apply for student loan and then in, basically incur debt in order to get a, get a, get a, get a MFA from us or, or MA in critical studies or something from us. And, and we don't want that. So, but, but, it's, but it's an urge that really like will make us really feel good, but also at the same time, maybe we should just not do it and stay in this sort of like in between, sort of like formal, informal. Yeah, and, and yeah, basically, basically, I don't want to, I don't want to go over time. It's already like, f I'm done with my 40 minutes. So yeah, so, and the people who have experienced our platform and taught for us, Kimberly, Klaus, and Marina are here. So maybe, maybe we can maybe begin with you guys, if you don't mind. Just, just a few comments and questions and get everybody else talking, because you guys have experienced it, right? <laughs> Klaus, you did too, right? You did one session, right? Oh, yeah, you, it's a session in, in, in Berlin, a live session. Oh, that live session in Berlin, but, but yeah, you're also yeah. part of the art history that's coming up, right? Yeah, Yeah. now I'm yeah. coming, yeah. I'm, I'm going to give a, a class on, on the problem of narrative in sort of identity formation and formation of identities of, of nations and communities and then also narrative in art and what the problem with it is and so on. Um, no, but I was re I was wondering what you attribute the, the early success of the of the new center to. I mean, there seems to be two things. There's a structural thing, and then there are also these strong convictions that you've been talking about, sort of getting out of post-structuralism, sort of critical stance to say the least on uh, on the value of identity politics. So, is it like for the, the contents that people? like find it interesting what have you experienced is it like see people who embrace the same kind of ideas that that come to the new center and don't find that being taught elsewhere no this is 
challenging question, but a very good and essential one. Of course, some of the people who come to us, they've totally researched us. They know exactly what kind of like stuff we are into and what they're getting into. And we indirectly sort of like signal that, that like, okay, this is not a place where you're gonna like learn about uh, post-colonialism. We appreciate it, it's great. There's a lot of other places you can, you can, you can study post-colonialism. There's a lot of other places for that. Our focus is something else. Our focus is what are the consequences of these rapid technological, environmental, political changes that are happening in the world and how can we sort of like gain agency again and be able to affect it. So this is sort of like, the, it's communicated. And but, but what happens is, the interesting part is like when people who, are, who don't really know where, where we're mostly focusing on this come in and then they kind of feel what is going on here and then the conversation becomes really interesting because they want to engage with what they know from these sort of like previous paradigms and they kind of bring it in and then create very interesting dynamics in the classroom with the professors because then the professors have to answer and it really like conditions the, the, the production of knowledge. What these people who don't know what we're about come in and expect us to just be like talking about the the th the, the normative theories of the of the time. So yeah, so I hope I answer your question. Maybe just talk about your experience as someone who taught I, at the new center. You guys asked me to teach a digital earth session about yes. Art criticism, essentially, and I didn't quite know what to expect, but it was um, I was amazed, it, just like you said, Google Hangouts, people popping in and out, but from rural Uganda, someone from deep into China, almost Central Asia, were uh, participating and asking questions that I almost had difficulties answering, but it made me think for at least two months. <laughs> um, information that I didn't have access to, I mean, I'm from this, you know, the American. Hegemony. It's, but they want, it, it, just like you said, it seems like the networks that emerge from the new center were probably impossible 10 years ago. Um, but I want to ask, what, what's the upshot? You said you've been offered now this degree granting program. Do you have, are you accumulating knowledge? Do you have a goal? Is, are you rolling with things as they come? I mean, I'm just wondering what the plan might be to put it the most okay. simply. Okay. So f first, let's, let's just get, get that first part of what you said. The, the program for Digital Earth was something, something we hadn't done before, which was like this new digital initiative based in, based in Netherlands came to us and they said, we got all this funding from HIFES. Some of you might be familiar with what HIFES does to basically create an online residency for artists. So instead of spending the money on airplane ticket and studio space and hotels for these artists, we will give them the money and tell them to stay home and use it to make projects, but then invite them to show it or come to a conferences that we will organize around the world to present their research. But as an educational component, they came to us and they said, why don't you organize two sets of seminars, one theoretical and one sort of like more artistic practice for them. So it was really like something we had never done before. So it was like they were outsourcing their educational side of their residency to us but it was really successful in a way. So then we, we learned from it and then we're offering seminars like that with many different instructors for one course. But also we're doing other projects. Now we're doing this thing for another initiative called um, The Power of Art. It's a bad name. Oh my God, I'm not gonna record it. Oh my God. <laughs> but it's got this like very like cheesy name, but it's really cool because again, 15 different research groups from around the world who are, who are like researching what art can do in their, in their context how art can be utilized in the context, are researching and then we're gonna hold their final sessions for them in which they will share their thing. And it's something that we're gonna start doing because it's something we're getting good at to like do it for other people. So hopefully maybe one day we'll do something for you guys but, um, or work with you somehow. But um, to answer your second question, my, my, the, 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 way, the way us and our board of directors kind of think about the future or like the, the smaller team from the board of directors that are like more intimately in touch because our board, we only meet like once a year or something, but I have a smaller group of board members who are more involved on a day-to-day -day, day -day business of the new center. We're thinking of how to basically even decentralize it further so other kind of activities can be self-organized by, by the members and they can organize their own stuff within it 
and then maybe some form of like uh, some form of developing our own social media. I mean, it's just the word is really like nasty now, but developing tools, infrastructures that allow our our members and our students to kind of like work with each other without even us needing to be at all involved. So that's the kind of like future we see moving into, like more decentralization. Because still right now it's very like modernist, you know what I mean? Like I'm the main curator. I essentially make decisions about who will teach, even though I try to keep my options open, keep a little bit of room for like unexpected people I meet all of a sudden I want them to teach, but still it's very much like top down, right? So it's about breaking down this and making it more sort of like self-organized with the help of like conceptual and, and te physical technologies. So we'll see how far we can go with that. Another thing we're really like focusing is to, is a skill that you don't really get in any art school or any university, which is like learn how to do what I'm doing right now. Basically get on a stage and comfortably talk about your ideas without running over time and without boring the audience. You know what I mean? Like the, the skills that like your professors expect you to just gain on your own. And if you're good at it, you get a job. And if you don't, you're just going to be terrible. So we want to like kind of like engage our students more into sort of like doing their final projects. If it's writing, we're going to encourage them to do a smaller version of it in video. So they learn how to sort of like talk to camera or talk to a crowd like this. And another thing is short form writing is something that we, we are, we are going to encourage. Like basically don't worry about writing 5,000 word essay. You can just say a lot in 700 words as long as you know what you're saying. Mean what you say, say what you mean, you can do it shorter. So these are sort of like smaller sort of like goals that we're trying to like experiment with in the next couple of seasons. Somebody in the very back. The microphone's here, so you might want to just come forward. Thank you. Um, I'm in a way just intrigued about the way how you think about the shape of the technology that you're relying on um, and the way it transforms or it shapes your proper thought. So I was quite surprised to hear that one of the basic platforms that you're working with is Google or starts with Google and goes on with Facebook and um, actually um, presents us a, a presentation uh, that is like could come directly out of these mediatic spaces. Yeah, I, I was using Google Slides, it's true. Yeah. Um, so in how far the fact to rely on these uh, yeah, technologies, yeah. but okay. also visual languages, okay. so. um, would shape the way uh, something that you present as a new way to relate to each other is finally deeply structured um, by the contrary of what uh, you might present. Okay. Do, you, do you understand the question you're asking is actually a philosophical question? It's not like a, is a you're asking me a philosophical question or, or there's a philosophical question implied in your question. So I'm gonna try to address that if you don't mind. And if it wasn't sufficient, then maybe we can like, see, the question here is that and it's, 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 it's an age-old question, right? At least as far as my mind, as far as I can just like spontaneously think about, it, it's like, it's like we're back to the question of like, you know, like the, the finitude of, fini the question of finitude, right? Like, and how sort of like we're shaped by the, by the tools we use, how we shape by the world, how we shape by our perception, how we're limited. So this is the question you're asking. Like, are, are, are we really limited by our, by our cognitive and perceptive, like what we have in terms of cognitive and perceptive resources? No, are we limited no, I, by, let me, yeah, let me, so, let me yeah. just, let me just, it's, it's my turn. Uh, are we limited by that? Or are we limited by the culture we're coming from? Are we limited by, it, it, it all becomes that. And, and we, one thing that separates us from this dominant, dominant sort of schools of thought is that even though these type, of, these type of paradigms, you can put like culture there, you can put religion there, you can put like technology there, you can put anything there, completely try to shape us, try to fully contain us, but we think, we think both individually but more so collectively 
we have the potential to get out of them and, and sort of go beyond it. Of course we're using Facebook and everything you type in, somehow they have access to it. Not only they have access to it, but they're using it to build their like supercomputers. Of course Google's evil, but I'm not gonna sit, sit at home and worry about it and think like everything I do in Google will, will c completely reshape my brain and turn me into a robot because I think both individually and collectively as what we call uh, general intelligence, we can find ways that can potentially get out of it. So that's what constitutes our rationale for using this and the fact that Seriously, uh, do, can we really find an alternative to it? No, because we're, pre we're it's like saying like, oh, Earth is so bad, let's just be in a different planet. Well, guess what, we're stuck on Earth and we're living on Earth, so we're just stuck here, right? So we're stuck in these, we're stuck in these things, c building, building original uh, infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure is very hard and costly and I think the art of what we do is the fact that we use these everyday tools to do something that hopefully let us get out of it. Hopefully, potentially. I'm not even saying that we have, right? So I hope that I answered you. Yeah, I think perfectly. So like the, 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 the way to frame it, I think, answers perfectly to my question. Um, I, I may just give one quote uh, back as as a kind of re reflection, which, b which would be the question of the dismantlement of the house of the master with the tools of the master. So in a way, this is also what artistic work is about, no? to think about how you reinvent your languages in order to reinvent the way uh, to work with them. I think I agree with you, but I think that, that that struggle you're talking about is a political struggle and it has to be fought in the in the political arena. And what I mean by political, I'm not just talking about like what today passes as politics, which is like everything is political, but I'm talking about actual politics, right? So if if we bring a government that will then say, for instance, Google and Facebook are public utility, just like electricity and water is, and they have to be owned by the government and then administered by a third party arm's length uh, set up in which like citizenry has control over how these algorithms are built to make sure that biases are not built into them, how the data stored so companies can access them and you choose who can have your data, when they can have it and all that. These will only be solved if we bring better parties and better politicians into power who already are getting their right ear and left ear by good people with these ideas that come from humanities and from sciences and telling them that like these are the needs and we're there with you I'm there with you let's do it because that's the only way to do it it's like you can't really like sit home and think like if you eat vegan you're just gonna like fix all the political problems of the world It's not gonna get fixed you know Oh wow, I have a microphone. It's so great because now I can also ask questions and talk with you guys and maybe also um, hang on her question in the way I, I understood it because I was pretty surprised to you about your answer because it kind of knit, fitted how I <laughs> understand her question. But anyway, these are just side remarks. It doesn't matter. My question is another one. So my question is, I mean, how do you actually deal with this like technological apparatus, like, I mean, uh, as having been a call center worker for a um, company that provides networks connection a long time, I also know that these geographies still matter also with networks, things like the co um, you have like uh, packet laws, you have like all sorts of things that actually the connection to Nigeria to like Berlin is not similar to the connection of Berlin to, to um, for example, a place called New York. And so I, I'm not sure if it isn't, uh, if the technical will not also like cause problems, especially if I think like access to data is still like quite uh, different from what it costs in different countries and also what devices pe people 
used to access it. So I'm just wondering how you deal with this. This is my first question and I hope you understand it. Yes, absolutely. And my second question, which is linked to this, is rather practical because I study in an art academy. We do this funny thing, old fashioned practice called art critique. And there we just show our art stuff to each other and I realized materiality matters. So how do you deal with this problem in your classes? Yes. Thank you for okay. having listened to me so long when, when I made it. up my okay. thought while talking. So you, you, your first question, of course, of course, the quality of connection from a student in, in New York is much better than a quality of a student coming from Africa, right? But our attitude is that we can't sit and wait for these things to improve because I remember when connection wasn't good in Canada. I remember when connection wasn't good elsewhere. So. These, these things will somehow, like, it, I, 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 I started to connect to internet in, like the first time I connect to internet at my home, it was 1991. When my friends would come home and say, what is that thing connected to your phone line? Are you a spy for CIA? What is that? And I would say, that's a modem. It connects, to, it connects you, use your phone line to connect you to the internet. And they say, what is internet? And it's like, oh my God, okay, I'll explain to you what the internet is. And, and back then, especially like early 90s, there was a lot of like academic papers written about like this, this, this like inequality in access to internet of like how everything's in English and there's like, it's, it's, gonna, it's never gonna become global because how you go, and somehow this stuff basically got, got almost not, not fully of course, but as, as these tools developed, they got kind of resolved, you know? I was just like, I just didn't even know that like Google Translate now does live. So I was just on my way here, I was just talking to the cab driver without any problem because the phone would recognize me as English and then it would translate it to German and say it to the, to the driver. And then when the driver spoke German, it just switched and it would translate it back to me. And this wasn't even available two months ago because you had to switch it and make sure and it would always like screw up, right? So these kind of like, these kind of technical questions, of course these limits are there, but, but hopefully they will disappear. And, but your second question I think is more, more fundamental and that is like, if you're teaching our classes, how you, how you deal with, with that. So far, oh my God. God, right? Okay, so. So far, we've tried to, the artistic practice seminars that we, we have there, we try to deal mostly with methodology. So we don't, we don't really have like an artist, like we don't have studio classes. Of course, it's a big limit and a challenge, but we provide that type of knowledge for, for the artists who, who come to our platform. Mostly like learning about artistic methodologies through studying with other, art, other artists, and then on the theoretical side, kind of like learning and reading about stuff that is not necessarily in the preview of the school they're attending or the university they graduated from. So we are like more heavy on the theory side and on the methodology side, artistic methodologies. And then it's, it's basically an engaging series of artist talks where an artist honestly tell you about how they made it, what kind of work they did, what kind of tricks they have to do. And some of these seminars are so amazing. Like when you get a generous artist, like Ahmed Ogut, or I don't know, I can name a few, but they actually talk about all the like stuff you never hear, all the background stuff of how curators deal with you, how like institutions deal with you, how the money side of it works out, how the traveling part of it works out. So, so it's a lot of practical knowledge it still can be communicated, even though the part you talk about is totally lacking and we don't know how to deal with it. So yeah, <laughs> it's just telling me to shut up. Right? He's like, okay, enough talking. Any other questions? Oh yeah, we also, uh, we, now that we are a little bit more comfortable, we also like uh, work with artists. It just doesn't stop, right? We, um, we work with artists, this is like our, 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 our like physical stuff, is that we try to do as many in-person events, like physical events, but they're not on a regular basis. So we do a lot of stuff in Berlin where I live, 
uh, with actually Spike magazine, the Austrian, the Austrian Spike. We can have their space as often as we want if you have good programming. So we've had, we sponsored Klaus's talk at, at Spike. Uh, we had a series of conversations between our students and professors in, in Spike where one party was present and one party was virtual. So either the student was in Berlin and the professor was online or the professor was in Berlin and the student was online. So we did that at, at Spike. And we just did a series of interviews with artists and curators and art professionals in, in Venice during the pre-opening days of Venice Biennale, which they all got uploaded. And then last April, we sponsored Francis Reuters amazing exhibition at Francis Kai uh, 3, right? Francis Kai 3 Gallery. And in September this year, we were sponsoring uh, Dayan Klodjegovic's show at the, what is it called? It's called Build a Room 7 Gallery. So these, this is how we try to compensate for those like, lacks of physical presence. Um, so my question, it's maybe a more philosophically worded version of Kimberly's question. You've talked a bit about um, embracing growth as a, as a concept, and how would you apply that to the new center? Well, it's, the, the, the physical growth of new center is just happening on its own. It's like, it's like I mean, knock on wood. Uh, we, first year when we started, we had, more people were mostly taking single seminars and then we had like one or two certificate students. Now it's shifted mostly towards like many, many certificate students who want a one year program and then very few do a single course. So the growth is just coming on its own. As the more we get, like the more we do our regular programming and the more people we hear about us, the more people are coming. If you mean physical growth. No, I mean also like in terms of thinking about um, the, conf the p potential conflict of accepting another university, um, oh, that creating right. degrees for yeah, you. That's the is thing. that a, that's like an old idea of what growth is. And in your case, it might not necessarily. Well, I was actually chatting with Simone about it, like how, how you guys in Global Academy feel like having this amazing program running for many, many decades without granting degrees, right? So it's like, I, I have no problem. Or like Whitney program, right? It's like they don't, they don't grant degree, but like we know that historically, doing Whitney program will really help your career as an artist or like as, a, as an art historian, right? So, so ideally for me, growth is like a place where Whitney program is or like Global Academy is that without giving degrees, you kind of slowly build a reputation that like makes people want to like come and experience you. I think that's the best way. I would, sorry, may I? Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about your students. Who are they? Are they regular art okay, students somewhere really else or artists yeah, or? Yeah, right. So our students, what happens is we have, like, we, have two, we have two like main programs that most students are attracted to. One is art and curatorial, artistic practice, artistic, art and curatorial practice and then philosophy. And philosophy is not theory, it's actually just philosophy, which means like philosophy. So, <laughs> I mean, people like theory with all this like stuff, you know, media theory, theory, that's cool and we do that too. But this is like philosophy program, right? So a lot of people who come to us are, are either people in un undergrad degrees in philosophy or some kind of like philosophically related stuff that they really wanna do PhD in philosophy and they're coming there because they want to sort of like gain new vocabularies and network in order to like apply for masters or PhD in philosophy. The artists to come to us are often people who are already in an MFA program, but they're in a, they're in a part of the world in which the MFA program does not give them theoretical tools enough or what they consider relevant or important theoretical tools. So they take their seminars and they actually go and get funding from their school. They say, I really want to do this, this thing. And then they get money to come to like one seminar or two or a whole certificate program. So then, or the artists who kind of like, they want to like inject new ideas into their, their practice. So they go like, okay, I want to like see what's going on. So we have that. In terms of artist people, it's mostly that. And then, but we also have a core group of people that whether they're artists or interested in philosophy, they don't want to use it for any, they don't want to put it towards any utility. They just want to be part of a supporting network that will sort of like embrace their ideas and get, 
get them to like write and because they're comfortable, they have jobs, they have a life, they have, they're lawyers. Like one of our like very like supportive uh, students is a, is a very successful corporate lawyer, but he's doing all these philosophy seminars and he's so well versed in, in the language. Another one is like a woman in New York. We were just actually talking about it, somebody here. She runs a very successful business. Her husband is a, is a, is a, like a management at the New York Times. And she's been doing three certificates in a row. She doesn't even care. She just wants more of it. You know, so we have also that group. And yeah, but, but we also have like young people who are ambitious, ambitious and they want to like learn something to put it towards something. So it's a, it's a mix of that. And it's age difference creates such good dynamics in the seminars. Part of my question before was just answered, but I'm wondering what this means in the bigger picture. You're, you were talking about um, maybe the increasing irrelevance of actual degree programs I and mean, all these di other difficulties you mentioned, but do you think that people are, young students are wanting to bypass traditional education? I'm from the States, of course, things are very expensive there, and there have been a, millions of articles about student debt, and are, are some of your students at least looking for yeah, totally. Some, some of them, some of them come to to go do a degree. They get convinced at New Center that like going to do a PhD in philosophy is just a waste of time, and they don't do it. But we never tell them to do either way because um, we are not there to tell you what to do. If you want to like use us to get into a good program, go ahead. If you want to just like learn about things and not really go to, go to the next level, that's fine too. But something came to my mind. I was going to tell you, but I forgot. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting moment. But we don't really, like, as I said, we don't really like go after universities because we receive a lot of support from different universities. We usually team up with them, we do programs. So it's like, it's totally fine. They have a role to play, we have a role to play. If you want us, we're there for you, so. How much time do you spend on this? You do many things, but is this? I work a lot. I work six days a week, 10, 11 hours a day. I think I'm, I like what I do. It, the rest of life bores me. I just like what I do. <laughs> I want to add, uh, to know about the uh, instructor, how uh, the lecturer, how you uh, choose them, and how do, uh, who they are. They come from different backgrounds. Uh, I normally like 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 a curator like does studio visits. I'm I constantly like meet people. Like I met someone someone really interesting today around your program, I'm not gonna name names. So these type of events for me is like, is like for me like they're like recruitment because I meet people, I ask them what they do and what they're about and I write their name down and I think about them and I go like that person would be good for that. So just like how curators do studio visits, that's how I meet people. I go to events like, like this or like when I'm at an opening or at another conference, I'm always looking for uh, thinkers and scholars and academic people who I don't know and I would like to work with them. So then, then I just, then I go home and I put them like art, you know, curators put artist lists together and say these go well together. I kind of do that. But mm, I work with theorists and philosophers and, and, and artists that way. So really that's how my, my research becomes kind of like a, a, a teaching program or like a education program later at the new center. But yeah, so did I answer you or you want more? It's good? So, uh, oops, this is not a good idea. <laughs> so thank you very much, Mohammed Salemi. It was a very, very good uh, and inspiring I hope you mean uh, it. lecture. I mean it, yes. <laughs> and also thank you for all these good questions. Uh, if you want to join us, I would suggest we go uh, to a beer garden sure. and we could continue with uh, the dialogue. We are going to the Stiegel uh, Keller, which is on the way up to the fortress, yeah? You perhaps you saw it, it's a beer garden, or you just follow us. Okay, thank you. Thank you.